الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وعلى أصحابه المهديين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين My mothers, my sisters, and my daughters in Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I cannot express in words how deeply privileged I feel. at the invitation which has been extended to me by the Muslim ladies of Durban and at this opportunity which has been provided to me for addressing you as a very humble servant in the cause of Islam a servant whose mission is to serve humanity and to place before mankind including the most important part of it that is the Muslim ladies about their duties and obligations about what is happening in the world today about what are the, those principles of life on the basis of which alone a womanhood can stay in a state of honor which is due to all women as women according to the Islamic teaching I am doubly grateful for the fact that my sister who is presiding at this function, Sister Fatima, is a scholar of sociology and teaches sociology at the university level. And as such, I have a very close affinity because I am also a university teacher. I have also been teaching besides philosophy, what is called uh, the subjects of culture and morals, which are very closely connected with sociology. <coughs> I wish I had been given a topic for this lecture and that would have made my task easier. But uh, my sister Fatima probably thought it wise not to confine me to any particular topic to give me a sort of freedom to speak what I might like to speak. The first thing with which I would like to begin is that the women folk are from the point of view of culture from the point of view of the preservation of ideals and ideas and beliefs, the more important part of humanity. All those great teachers of mankind whose names you read in human history, 
every one of them was indebted to a woman for coming into this world and for getting his initial and original background and training in life from a woman. Unfortunately, it has been forgotten very often. When we read the history of mankind, we find that in almost all the cultures of the world, a woman has been exploited simply because she is the weaker sex in respect of her physical life. Physically, she can never be so strong, her function of life being what it is, which a man can be. And this extremely superficial weakness of the woman as compared with the man very unfortunately led different cultures and civilizations to exploit the woman. The thing becomes tragic when you find that even men like Aristotle, who is considered to be the father of modern philosophy, he had uh, nothing rational to say about women. For instance, he says that woman is the freak of nature. He says that when nature fails in producing the real human being, that is man, then the product is woman. The same view was held by Plato. Similar views have been held even by the medieval and some of the modern thinkers as they are called, for instance, men like Schopenhauer. Among the religions of the world, again, so far as the records of history are concerned, we find that woman was regarded as a chest. In one of the greatest religions of the world today, this thing reached its climax. I am referring here to the Judai Christian teaching, which is given in the book of Genesis, and is developed into a theory that was extremely insulting the woman. When you read the book of Genesis, you find there the story of the creation of the world and the creation of Adam and the creation of Eve from the rib of Adam. At the very beginning, woman is made subservient to man as an aberration or an irrational aberration on the scene of the human life, not very much different from the point of view of Aristotle. Then we are further told that when the devil in all his devilishness conspired to bring the, about the fall of Adam, as it is called, it is said, and St. Paul emphasizes it very strongly, that the devil was not able to get hold to overcome Adam because Adam had been created in God's own image. The wordings of St. Paul are, O oh woman, 
the curse of God rests on thee for all time. Because it was thee who led him astray whom God had created in his own image and whom the devil could not lead us. It is said that when the devil failed to beguile Adam, he approached the counterpart of Adam, that is Eve, and he fell into her trap. And because it is the weakness of man to fall a prey to the charm, the woman, especially if she is a wife. In, among the Hindus it is called Tiriya Chalakkar. They say therefore it so happened that this great, great, great Adam also was brought into the trap. And thus took place the original sin and the fall of Adam for which Eve, as the first woman in the history of mankind, was responsible. Of course, if you think about it further, you find that the English language has enshrined this idea of the evil nature of Eve in its language itself. The English nation has enshrined this idea in the language itself. Because that which belongs to Eve is evil. From the, ling from the linguistic point of view, evil is that which belongs to Eve. And add a D to it in the beginning and it becomes devil. <laughs> so they say, so they say that there was a very natural affinity between Eve and the devil, and that was the reason why Eve could be deceived and led astray by the devil as compared with the role of Anna. And on this, of course, a whole theology was built up. If you read the writings of the early fathers of the Christian Church, I quote it to you from St. Paul, who is the real founder of the church, according to history. Others also did not lag behind in, in showering curses on womanhood, in discrimination. St. Jerome, St. Tertullian, St. Athanasius, and so many saints of the early Christian church gave the titles to women, which, are, which of course cannot be flattering for her at all. They call her the sting of the Spartan, the hissing of the serpent, the gateway to hell, the daughter of iniquity, and of the wild beast, the most vicious. Things did not improve even when the Christian fathers started learning philosophy. It is thought that philosophy creates a sort of widening of the vision and outlook. But things did not improve even then because when we go to St. Augustine, who was a highly cultured man from the standards of those days, and even now he's mentioned in the books on philosophy and so on and so forth, as an eminent person. Even when we go to this great man, St. Augustine, we find giving advice to the men folk, of course advice has got to be given only to the men folk, and this has also been copied by some of our Maulanas, to which my sister was referring, that they, they consider it a, 
a very devilish act to come before the ladies, their own sisters, and talk to them something about religion. It is probably a heritage from that side. <laughs> Friend of the sciences, he says, I would not suffer a man to defy the sanctity of his personality through the filth of leading a married life. Then he goes after that, he feels a little compassion, not for the woman at all. But for man himself, he says, there is only one exception. If there is a man who is afraid to sleep alone at night, then he can be permitted to marry. <laughs> well, that was the story. The poor woman was exploited as a slave and as a chattel. The Hindu lawgiver Manu says, a woman should always remain in subjection to man. As a wife to the husband, as a widow to the son, as a sister to the brother. And consequently, the great act of piety was prescribed for the woman, that is, the husband dies. It will be an act of great piety on the part of woman to throw her, herself into the funeral pile. But it was not prescribed for, for men. Probably man is incapable of love according to them. Then if a wife dies, the man may also demonstrate his love by throwing himself into the funeral fire. This, this, I think, Sister Fatima, it uh, uh, gives us a clue that they regarded woman as superior, probably, in this way. Yes. It's a tragic tale. Read the encyclopedia of religion and ethics. Read any book on history of morals. Read any book on sociology in connection with customs and morals, and you will find this tragic history written and recorded. When the Holy Prophet came, he came in this world and he came to a community which had gone a few steps ahead in connection with the exploitation of women on the basis of hatred and contempt. Not only did the women folk enjoy absolutely in legal position or in moral status in the Arab society of those days, the Arabs of those days considered it an act of greatest virtue to bury their daughters alive. They thought the birth of a daughter as, as something shameful for them. A man could marry any number of women. A exception could compulsorily inherit his stepmother as his wife, and so on. And that thought was there, which very unfortunately has continued even in the mouths of certain Mormons up to this day, that Eve was born from the rib of Adam. The Quran doesn't say this. The Hadith doesn't say this. It is blasphemy. It is something which has been taught only by Christianity and Judai. What the Quran says on any occasion when I am going to speak on creation and the emergence of man and how they were formed according to the Quran, 
because we have the notion i heard it from my elders when i was young boy and i have been hearing it in the theological seminaries of the muslims also that one fine morning god made the statue like a portal or a clay and then breathed into him his breath and lo and behold there was adam running on the on the ground this anthropomorphic conception has absolutely no reference to anything that has been taught in the quran or in the hadith recently i was reading but i have referred to it with great pain because recently i was reading and my wife was sitting with me in the car at karachi and i got the mail from south africa a book which is being printed in south africa in urdu and which goes to different parts of the world in installment there was a big qasida in praise of womanhood throwing all the curses on her a book written by some eminent muslim maula but terrible things have been told there which are absolutely baseless and for that they have taken the old christian thought that eve was born of the rib of adam therefore rib is therefore eve and or woman is born to be subservient to man and the slave of man she cannot have any independent status whether legal or economic or moral or spiritual and so women's parts have been mentioned in this urdu book which is being printed in south africa and the central <coughs> my wife took that paper from my hand and she started reading she said what who wrote this book i said some great maulana he said but is it correct what he has said here i told her i said you are also a student of islam why do you ask me about it? she said but this is all nonsense i said so is the lady you may write a letter of protest to the public uh this this dogma that the woman was responsible for the original sin so called and according to the bible of course that original sin was not forgiven by god and consequently the or- the impact of that original sin continues and the special type of handicap from which a woman suffers physically here in this life are a, a mark of added punishment to her because she was the culprit real culprit behind all this drama now the holy prophet alayhi salatu wassalam pronounced a masculine revolt against read the quran there are some people, some people who say that what the quran teaches and what the bible teaches and what the vedas teach and what the gita teaches and what this teaches and that it is is the same unfortunately not it would have been something very fortunate if it had been so he made he, he removed all those wrong notions and in that connection if you look up the story of adam and eve as given in the quran and as given in the bible you will find that the quran even there proves fully that it is a book based on divine knowledge and divine wisdom and not wishful thinking of man against woman or woman against man or this tribe against that tribe the one of the orientalists 
and these orientalists play a very malicious role. Unfortunately, he has said about Islam that Islam is the bastard child of Judaism and Christianity. But probably this bastard child is fairer, healthier, nobler, sublimer, and better. When you read the story of Adam and, and Eve, you find there, the Bible says that the devil wanted to beguile Adam, the Quran also says that. Then the next is that, who was beguiled? The Bible says that it was the Eve because of her evil, uh, because of her, of her affinity with evil, she was beguiled. Come to the Quran and you will read, فَأَذَلَّهُمَ الشَّيْطَانُ anha. When the Quran comes on, at this point, it says, both of them, both of them were led astray simultaneously. And it is saying this also not by taking names, it uses a dual pronoun, أَذَلَّهُمَ Usually, dual pronoun in order that Muslims may not fall into the error later on, that if Adam has been mentioned, then they might say that Adam was more guilty, and if Eve is mentioned first, then they might think that Eve was more guilty. So the Quran has not mentioned the names here, but given a dual pronoun, pronoun for two persons, and said, Azallahumma shaytanu an. So the entire guilt has been removed, that special crime of Eve and so on and so forth, that entire theology has been broken to pieces and thrown away. Of course, the story runs like that and so far as the book of Genesis in the Bible is concerned, it contains many more things of that sort. This is not my topic tonight. The Quran proclaims, Ya ayyuhan nasi taku, Rabbakum ulladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahidah, wa khalaqa minha zawjaha, wa basta minhuma, rijalan kathiran wa nisaha. Now here some people have stumbled. It says, Be careful of your in respect of your uh, dealings with one another, who created you from a single living entity and made it made thereof out of. People say, look here, here is the story. That Adam was made first and Eve was made out of the rib of Adam. If they could have learned a little of biology, probably they could have been able to under, understand what God Almighty is saying here. We know in biology that the unitary cell, which is the basis of life, multiplies itself through fission. The cell is like a sort of, a, is a sort of cup. You may imagine it's a very, very tiny cup. The fission takes place in that, and when the fission takes place in that, two walls emerge in the middle of that cell. And then these two walls or these two screens separate from one another, and in this manner, one cell becomes two. Khalaqakum min nafsim wahida never says that Khalaqakum min Rajulum wahid created you from a single man. It is only saying created you from a single living organism. And as we know in biology, the single living org organism which is the Basis of life is the unitary cell. And the unitary cell multiplies through fission. That is something very well known and which cannot be debated. It is the, that cell 
which revolves to become Adam on one side and Eve on the other. That was the first cell which came into being. Of course, I have not to talk here on the evolution of man. But actually, actually, that story, that cock and bull story type of thing, you see, which is there, is not mentioned in the Quran or in the Hadith. And the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu was salam consequently em emphasizes in the words of the Quran itself that both are human beings of the same category. And the status of both is the same. Of course, what are ca called conditions, variability of conditions, or a status according to condition. In that respect, man stands superior at certain places, at certain stations in life. So does woman. It is not that superiority has been writ large by Islamic theology on the forehead of man. Not so. Man is the equal according to Islam. The husband and wife, they have got equal legal obligations to one another. The wife is not subservient to the husband. Lahunna misrul ladhi alayhinna bil maruf. To them is due what is due from them. It is the law of equity. And here the Quran mentions, of course, Walir Rijale Alayhinna Daraja, that the husband is one degree above the wife. Lahunna Misrul Ladi, first of all, it says that they are equal, then it says that the husband is one degree above. What does it mean? It means that as human beings they are equal. But as functionaries in society, as members of a family, they, that one degree of being superior in function to the wife has been given to the husband on a very rational ground. The husband is more capable of Undergoing the hardships of life, the husband is more capable of being a support for others. She does not suffer from those handicaps, the physical handicaps from which the wife suffers. And consequently, this law has been laid down which is natural and it has been, we have been told at another place, Ar-Rijalu Qawwamuna Ala Nisa. The husbands are the protectors and guardians for their wives. This is the same thing as saying, an easy lies the head that wears the crown. The poor husband should remain awake the whole night if anything goes wrong with the wife or if there is any danger for the wife because he has been made the guardian and protector of personality and the honor and the everything of the wife. Here, the crown has been placed on his head, but it is a crown of thorns, because the Quran goes, goes on to say, Ar-Rijalu Qawwamuna Ala Nisa'i Bima Faddal Allahu Ba'dahum Ala Ba'd Because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has given superiority in points of different elements in human life, to different persons among you. He has not given the same capabilities to all human beings. وَلِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ And because the economic burden also has been placed squarely on the shoulders of the husband alone. And here I might state the law, Islamic law. If the husband is poor, 
and your wife is rich, she might inherit from her parents and become rich, or she might earn. Earning one's living for a woman has been clearly laid down in the Holy Quran. There is absolutely no disqualification in that respect for a woman. If she is more wealthy than the husband, and the poor husband is not able to make the two ends meet in connection with his financial obligations to the family, according to the Islamic law, the husband can only request and plead for help from the wife, cannot force her. Cannot force her, according to the Islamic law. And this, if he forces his wife, according to the Islamic jurist, it will be, it will form a valid ground for the wife to obtain a divorce from the husband. I don't want this husband who is all the time teasing me. And he wants to take away my own wealth. The husband cannot, according to the Islamic law, force his wife even to bear her own expenses. Because they also rest squarely on his shoulders. Poor thing. He is like the rickshaw driver of Durban. Whenever he is asked by the family, the poor fellow has to drive the rickshaw of his family day in and day out. Well, this as regards the comparative status of the husband and the wife. He has been made the guardian, and because all the obligations have been placed on her, on him, therefore he has been given the right of widow. We who are, anybody who is a student of politics, knows it, or of sociology, knows it, that you cannot build, you cannot organize an institution without unity policy. There must be a, the, the governing policy must be in the hands of one person, whether it is the state or it is the family or it is a college or it is a school or it is a anything else, you see. This is the law. And it ought to have been the law because the ruler and creator of this world is one. It is God. So, from this point of view, equal power could not be given to the husband and the wife. Cannot be given, otherwise the family will go to dogs. The wife will use her veto and the husband will use his veto and both are within right. And the poor children will just stand there and weep. You see, they cannot come, the family cannot be done. So the obligations have been placed on the husband and also the right of it. But how is this right to be exercised? The first principle of Islamic social life is that all human beings should base their dealings on the principle of goodwill and understanding towards one another. That is the first principle of Islam. Islam calls it Islam. Wa aslihu zata bainakum. And it then goes beyond that. Wa la tansawul fadla bainakum. Do not forget magnanimity in your dealings with one another. Not only just that. Not only the maintenance of peace in a healthy society, but magnanimity and grace, because you also would like to have grace from God. So, exercise it here. And this grace is to be exercised against those who are weaker than us, who are placed in our charge. So, the principle in Islam is, that is the first principle, which is a universal rule or law of Islamic social life. The other principle is, Amruhum Shura Bainahum. 
that Muslims are those who pursue all their activity in life, all their dealings, on the basis of mutual consultation only and not in the spirit of dictators. This will apply, both of these principles will apply much more to the dealings between the husband and the wife rather than to any, any other deal. So the husband cannot behave according to Islam as a dictator. He cannot say, because I am the husband, because I am doing all this, therefore it is within my right to order you, my good lady, like this. Behave like this or get out from here. He can't say. His function is that of a guardian. His function is that of a protector. And legally both stand equal in a status. Consequently, he, he shall have to discuss the problem with his wife respectfully, decently, and nicely. And only when he finds that the wife, wife's opinion in a particular matter is wrong, as it can be, then he'll say that in the interest of my family, for the sake of God, I wish to take a line of action which you don't approve. And now that I have taken this decision, you will have to abide by it. And the Quran gives the order there to the wife. You must abide. Otherwise, you see, I mean, say, when you look at the problem from the practical point of view, a person may become academic or a theoretician, but if you look at the problems from the practical point of view, this is how the social relations can be properly adjusted. Now, this is the position of the woman in Islam as regards her role as wife. Beyond this, she is superior to man. She is three times superior to man as a mother. Three times and even beyond that probably. Because it is about her that the Holy Prophet has said, Paradise lies by the feet of the mother. He never said it lies by the feet of the father. I mean, say this is not poetry. Don't pass on this just like that. And I would like, it, especially the men folk, to think on this. The Holy Prophet Ali Salatu was was not a poet. He was a wise teacher and guide for mankind. And every word that he said, is, he was always extremely careful. And he was being guided by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in everything that he said. As the Quran says, "Wama yamsafu anil hawa in huwa illa wahin duha." He does not speak of his own incentive or desire. Every word that he speaks is, is under the impact of the divine wisdom and he is guided in that by God. Imagine this. What does it mean? Paradise to be by the side of the feet of the mother. What does it mean? Is it a joke? Is it something meaningless? Does the mother after that stand at the same level where the father stands? How can it be? I mean, say, paradise has been made the goal for you and for me. That which is the goal of all endeavor in life, we have been told that kiss the feet of the mother and there you will find the paradise. And consequently, when we read, Uh, in the books of Hadith, we find that legally, the mother is three times superior to a father. Then we read that a sister is twice superior to the brother. The daughter is twice superior to the son. 
that is not a blind law of equality which the modern western civilization has given and i'll come to that blind modern western point of view he why he gave all that belong to the woman and made her equal as a human being as the quran says innal muslimina wal muslimati wal mu'minina wal mu'minati they, they are in this verse in the 20th uh, 23rd part of the quran it makes it clear you see that any act, action of virtue or any action of vice whether it is committed by man or it is committed by woman it has the same effect it is not that because a man is performing an act of virtue therefore he will be rewarded more like certain pre islamic religions where woman was regarded to be a filthy creature she could not even go into the temples to obtain the eucharist or the blessing from the priest in her naked hands she can't do those religion is still exist while em- emphasizing this thing and give, lay, laying down in natural law islam also emphasized the fact that the woman is the more important part of mankind if the woman goes astray if the woman falls into wicked ways or evil things humanity will suffer much more than when a man falls in. of course the unfortunate thing about it is that we men and women become partners in all evil things if not all in most evil things but the holy quran in emphasizes what we have been told for instance the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world if you wish to reform a social order begin with the ladies because every human being comes into the, this world in her lap he knows the woman first he or she whoever they are every human being gets the first lessons from a woman and the impressionable age of childhood is spent with the mother the god the father of course has to go every morning to earn living to earn the daily bread and it is generally the mother who is sent who, who, who is there by the side of the child so until the child grows into a sort of independent adult he has to remain in the company mostly of his mother if the mother is educated culture pious possessing moral integrity and possessing wisdom the child is going to get his share out of that not from the father the father may be a, an anything of his time the, the father doesn't get the time cannot get the time that is also not natural so if we wish to reform any society we should begin with the ladies and if anyone wants to deform any society it should also begin with the ladies the women folk are the last fortress the women folk or womanhood is the is starting point of every religion and of every culture and of every civilization the foundations are laid in her lap and the wo- and womanhood is also the last fortress once that is broken 
no religion and no culture and no civilization can do. Consequently, Islam has taken the greatest care that the woman should be protected more than man. And that's why you will find in the Quran a special laws which have been given which curtail the freedom of the woman. Freedom of movement. Freedom in point of behavior. That a woman should always be very, very graceful. She, she should not allow herself to be vulgar at all like some of the men. If a man becomes vulgar, not much is lost. If a woman's life becomes vulgar, everything is lost. Once a lady asked me a question in Ottawa probably, in Canada. I was speaking there at the Ottawa uni University. She asked me a question about the status of women in Islam. I answered it. She bluntly retorted, what do you say about the Farda system? I say, Farda is not compulsory in Islam in the manner in which it has been practiced in India. But even if it had been compulsory in Islam, it would have been better than what, uh, it would have been better than the rules of conduct which you are of observing here in this country. How? How can you defend the Farda? I understand that you are a doctor of philosophy. How can you speak like this? This is a very vulgar point of view. This is a very backward point of view. I said, no, my good lady, it's not. She said, can you say something in its defense? I said, yes, I can. I said, look here, my good lady. God is the creative force in the universe, the central creative force. He is hidden. He is behind the Farda. The woman is the creative force in human society. Should she Im imitate God or imitate the devil who goes about naked like that? A woman is the creative force in human, in, in human society. Then again I said, I said, look here, my good lady, if you have a piece of pebble that you have picked on the seashore, which just cost nothing and has no value, would you place that piece of pebble in a safe, lock? Said, no, why should I? What do you mean? I said, but my good lady, if you have, if, if you have a good diamond, you are not going to throw it on the road. You will keep it there right in the, in the, in the safe, won't you? She said, yes. I said, yes. Islamic culture regards the women folk as diamonds and your culture regards the women folk as pebbles and stones. And that is so. That is so. Different Muslim communities might have given it a sort of perverted twist. And in different Muslim communities there may be men, as I know them in Pakistan, who are extremely anti-Islamic in their behavior and attitude towards the demon folk. That is beside the point. We are talking here in terms of Islam, what Islam stands for. Islam stands for this. That the moral and spiritual health of the Muslim society, for that the custodians can be the Muslim ladies 90% and the Muslim men only 10%. That is the obligation that Islam has placed on the demon folk. For the interest of the human society, Islam wants 
wants to be meant to be modest. By modest I mean what is called in Urdu or Arabic Thaya to cultivate innocence and not to cultivate vulgarity in my life. And remember, it's a fact that one slip in the wrong direction. It is the poor woman who suffers and man goes scot-free. Scot you cannot bring charge against a man. If a man and woman do anything bad, the woman is caught. The man goes is caught. Who should take greater care? Who should take greater care? Who should be protected from the voluptuous eyes of the wicked and the rogues who roam in the street? Naturally the woman. If the womanhood of a community is destroyed morally, as I said and I must repeat a number of times, then everything is lost. This point of view which the Holy Prophet gave to the woman, this philosophy of life by which he lent a halo of dignity and greatness to the woman, got a counter blast. Probably the theory of Hegel is right. Hegel has given a theory of dialectic idealism where he speaks of the thesis and the antithesis and a continuous process of the welding of thesis and antithesis into synthesis and then again forming another link and so on, which means that every action brings about a reaction. And because every action brings about a reaction and because we are told in science that the ac action and reaction are equal and, and opposite, there was a reaction to Islam, to the message of Islam, to the revolutionary message of Islam on all fronts. And not until simpletons, simpletons among the Muslims who unfortunately were leaders, not until they were deceived in connection with understanding the ideals and mission of Islam, not until then the, the Muslim community was forced to see those evil days which it is now seeing in centuries. But well, that is not my topic. The reaction came. Islam blasted to pieces the drawn notions that were there among other communities, Islam gave a very healthy outlook and Islam gave to women a dignified history. The voice of the Prophet encoded this. It was captured in Europe at the time of the Renaissance. As we all know, the Renaissance was brought about through the impact of Muslim scholarship and Muslim culture. In the wake of the Renaissance came the ideas of liberty, equality of man and woman. Very noble idea. Preached by the Holy Prophet. But there was a string in it. Everything, every principle 
can be planted in different soils, in different perspectives. The principle is the same, but the perspective is different. And that perspective will give it a new color and a different color. What did it mean in the Western society? And what is it is meaning now in the westernized society, even of the Muslims? It meant this. Hello, Begum Sahiba. You good lady, you are you who are sitting here on the sofa comfortably and I, poor husband, going out and working in the factory. Look here, we both are equal. What is this superiority that you have arrogated to yourself? You live on the, you live your life on comfortable couches and I work from morning till evening in the factory and mill on the road. Come on, get out of this home with me. I and you are equal. You also earn and I also earn. Share this burden equally with me. Don't sit comfortably like this, like this, like the queen. You are my equal, my good lady. This was the philosophy. What a beautiful equality. This is a matter of history. This is not imagination, this is a matter of history. Another aspect of this equality. Another aspect of this equality was that if a family aroused a, a young son, a young boy, say of 18 or 20, to remain outside the home up to 12 o'clock midnight, men and women are equal. The girls of 18 and 20 should also be permitted and should never be asked when they come back at 12 o'clock as to where you have been, my daughter. No, there is bad manners according to the Western society. This is equality. What for was this equality enacted? I told you that the pre-Islamic civilizations exploited women as, a, as cattle. This modern west of the industrialized age of the 20th century starts a, a bit the, the refined manner of treating the women folk in the same manner and exploit. When they had their good philosophers, may God deal with them who have led the humanity astray. Those good philosophers further defined it, this principle of equality, and tried to teach the women folk that you should behave like men in order to impress this equality. They also taught and educate a moral code wherein the woman could be exploited as a toy. This is a refined way, way of murdering the Christians and dignity of woman. Not as a chattel. They said, no, 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 we consider you as our equal. But look here, my dear, won't you like to be treated as a child? What? Something good? She said, yes. All right. She is being destroyed in this child. I will refer my sister who is a professor of sociology. Yes. To bear witness to the fact that the history of culture, the history of the sociological phenomena in the Western society has been an extremely tragedy. Up to the medieval ages, when the Western social life was under the blind impact of the church, 
and woman was the incarnation of evil, woman was suffered. When these great emancipators came, he suffered first. He has suffered in suffering worse. In those days, poor ladies could get some compassion from the side of men. Now, not. All those principles have been forgotten in the West. Ladies first in this thing and that thing, which came in the age of chivalry immediately after the Renaissance. That was a glow which did not last long. If you read the books on culture, for instance about England, it was formerly a British colony. So we have quite a close relation. I also, my, my country was also a British colony. Try to find out about the women folk of the Victorian age, of the Victorian era. There are photographs available, paintings available, descriptions available. The women of the Victorian era, not only in England but also in the United States, also in France and in Germany and Holland and Belgium and elsewhere, used to put on a full dress, the apron, high neck, full sleeves, Right up to the end. That was the fashion. Well, this time really the devil came to eat. He couldn't come there directly, see, but here he found a way of doing it. So he came. He said, What? You are in the time of your youth. You are the very embodiment of beauty and charm and grace. But look here, you look like a grandma. <laughs> and you cannot get what you want. The poor, innocent girl heart in emotion. My good sympathizer, what should I do? Can you advise me? They said, yes, I can. Take a pair of scissors. Cut your frill from here. Remove the high neck. Have the quarter sleeve. That is the first. The poor Western girl did it. She stood up. How, how, how do I look? Yes, not like a grandma, but still you see like a nun. <laughs> you are not going to achieve your goal. That is too much of conservatism of God. Be modern, be progressive, go ahead. He said, what did I do? Take the pair of feeders and employ it first. The high neck had been removed. A zip was open here. The frill had been cut, cut up to this place. It came to the knees. The quarter sleeve, the entire sleeve went. And then this world Girl of the 20th century, she stood up, asked everyone whom she met, how do I look? They said, not yet. Not yet. 
exasperated and flabbergasted gazed in there to the dressing room it stood before a mirror cut it further Yes, it became a minister. <laughs> then she went to the market where she could sell her grace in marriage to a young man. Asked XYZ, Mr. Roberts and Mr. Williams and Mr. Godfrey. They were unanimous in their opinions. You look a bit young, but not yet the flower of youth and beauty. And if you want the hand of somebody, well, be more wise. You have only traveled the way seventy-five percent. The poor girl was amazed, confused. Thinking, what back? What should I do? How long am I going to become absolutely naked? She was. She asked her mother. She said, "Yes, uh, you know, they were the good old days of the 19th century when your father married me, and now I am 80 or 90 years old." Now time to change. Time to change. My my dear daughter, it is necessary to you see to have a partner in life, and now these partners in life have become just like that. God cursed the universities. They are being taught all sorts of nonsense, not the Bible. So now with the time. No. So you decide. And then what happened? She invented a dress. One string coming from here, all black. One strip here. And a high heel shoe when he came to the dinner party. I have seen it. I am not talking with you. I have seen it in Europe and in America. I have seen ladies walking into the dinner party just with this dress. And those who didn't want to do it, they said yes. This mini skirt also appears to be something very outworn and outmoded and conservative. Uh, well, there can be something else. The inventors of fashion in France. When I went to France the first time, I wanted to find out because France was very famous for fashion. I wanted to find out as to who invents fashion for the ladies. So in Paris, I went to the to those places and I found that all these fashion shops for the ladies, all these factories where the inventors of fashion are, all those inventors of fashion are men and not a single lady. That's the truth. So he, he said, "It is an age of specialists." If you are suffering from ear ache, then go to an ear specialist. If you are suffering from an in the eye, then go to an eye specialist. And this problem has become too short. It has become so complicated that I should not just ask my girlfriends or boyfriends or my mother. Those those people I have asked, so I should go straight to the specialist. In fact, she went. The specialist in fashion presented to her something. She said, "As they say in Urdu, Bhagwan ko kuch rahe, Razi rahe, Sayyad." Is he to kill two birds with one stone? 
the inventor of fashion devices in many, many Many, many years back. It comes only after this place. And then she said, Do I look handsome? The boyfriend said, Yes, you do. Yes, you do. But only as a guy, not as a woman. But the grace had been lost. The courts in the Western world were full of divorce cases. The laws were changed. The United States, a state, changed the law, brought a law of companionate marriage. The law of companionate marriage is that if a man and a woman live fully as husband and wife, experimentally for one year or two or three or four or five or seven years their action will be built within the law. My lawyer friend is here. They experiment in order to find out whether after living in this companionate marriage, in this state of companionate marriage, they would be able to live safely as husband and wife in a stable manner. All right. When after all this experimentation they marry, then the findings are that all such marriages which are contracted, more than 50% of them end in divorce diversion. That is human nature. Here actually man is exploiting the woman. All this drama of fashions and civilization and modernism is being played only for the sake of exploiting the woman. This is not a mere assertion. Have you ever thought, my sister, why is it that if any shopkeeper wants to boost up his sales, he shoves aside the man salesman. The salesman who is a man and brings a sales girl to the company. My sister Fatima. What is the sociological implication? What is the implication behind this? That all paying advertisements and effective advertisements carry the figure of a woman. And I have seen, I am a world tourist, I have seen 90% naked pictures of women being displayed by the roadside in advertisement. Should I prove further? This, that this modern man of this modern western civilization has only one aim to exploit the woman. Of course, Methods have become refined. In the olden days, if anybody wanted to murder another person in the stone age, then he would take just a sharpened stone and sit on his chest and use it for about one hour until his neck was totally cut. When civilization advanced further, then they could make swords, you see, with sharper agents, daggers. When civilization Technological civilization advanced further. They invented the pistol and the revolver. The entire history of mankind is history of exploitation of woman by man. In spite of the fact that woman is the most valuable treasure of mankind. 
mightiest spirit. Beware. Bad ghost of modernism. Bad ghost of vulgarity. Bad ghost of obscenity. Bad ghost of shameless behavior. And destruction of the purity and dignity of womanhood. is also on the road and in the home of your country without effort. It has entered. It has entered. The bacteria of this plague are there. The germs of this plague are there. They are spreading fast and wide. If you wish to save your dignity, if you wish to save your future, if you wish to preserve the highest values of human life, you will have to be very cautious. Very cautious. You will have to take a very definite stand against all. I know that the Muslim communities are tossing between the evils of conservatism and modernism, two extremes. But I am sure most of you are educated. Most of you possess the sense of understanding what is good and what is bad. And I interest to all of you who are here, my mothers and my sisters and my daughters, the mission of extending and waging a war, all out war, against this devil of destruction which has come in your midst with an innocent face, but with a dagger concealed under the armpit. May Allah save you all. Assalamu alaikum. This did not include questions from the stage, but I'm taking this liberty because I'm here and I've seen that nobody is making a move from the floor or the balcony. Mulana Ansari made a reference that Islam does not defy women from making and living, earning and living. Would he like to elaborate on that point a bit further? Under what circumstances is a woman allowed to go out of her home and earn a living? Holy Quran and the Hadith of the Holy Prophet just as they do not make any distinction between man and woman as regards the obligation of acquiring knowledge and pursuing knowledge. As we have been told, for instance, in the hadith, Salab al ilm faridatun ala kumli muslim wa muslima. Acquisition of knowledge is a duty incumbent on every Muslim man and every Muslim woman. Similarly, in connection with earning one's livelihood, if the need arises, it has been affirmed, and the right of the woman to earn her living has been affirmed, and the right of economic independence of the woman has been affirmed clearly by the Holy Quran and in the Hadith. Of course, the universal principle of the Islamic way of life will have to be maintained at every place that when the Muslim ladies go out of their home, whether they go to friends or they go for shopping or they go for requiring education or they go for earning their living, they should go with that decorum and that grace with which Islam wants them to behave. 
And they should see that where they are going to earn their living, their integrity of personality will remain intact. After that, I will say this principle of the economic independence of the woman, I think so far as my knowledge goes, it was first of all given by Islam. The Holy Quran is very clear on this. لِلْرِجَالِ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا تَسَبُوا وَلِلْنِسَاءِ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا تَسَبُوا Men have the right of possession, of ownership on that which they earn, and the women have got the right of ownership on that which they earn. So unless the possibility of earning for the uh, women folk was not there, this work would not have been there in the Quran. Uh, but there is another aspect to it also, as I made it clear, that Islam wants men to undertake these hardships, because earning the living is not uh, walking on a bed of roads. And Islam wants the point of view of Islam is, as the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu has laid it down, al-mar'atu sayyidatu baytuha. Woman is the queen of her house. Woman is the chief of her house. To the extent that even the husband should consider him to be the guest of his wife when he comes into the house. To the extent that it is the Islamic etiquette that even when the husband comes to the house, he should inform and take permission from the wife for coming into the house. We very often forget that whatever a community achieves outside the home, outside the family life, or I should use the home, definitely, it achieves much more inside the home. The foundations of a culture and the foundations of the progress of a community, the spiritual and the moral and cultural foundations are laid inside the home, primarily. And uh, to say that man and woman both should be asked to make it the rule of their lives to go every morning outside their homes and to come back in the evening and leave their children to the fondling hospitals or to the orphanages or to the hospitals or inside the home to the care of their servants. I think uh, it is through this way only damage can ultimately come. Even from the economic side, it is not that, I will say, the national potential of wealth is stands at a definite level. Now, even from the economic side, it is not that, I will say, the national potential of wealth is stands at a definite level. Now, if men and women both earn their living out of that, maybe that some people feel it like that and see that this national potential will increase. I doubt it. Really. But even if it increases, there is something very positive and very fundamental that decreases. The children are deprived of the affection and the care of their parents. Definitely they ought to be. So, according to the spirit of Islam, a woman should undertake earning her living if it is in a factory or if it is in an office and so on, outside the home, only 
when there is no other way out. And if in case he has children to look after. Of course, there can be, as I saw in Japan, they have got the cottage in industry. And Japan, who is industrially probably more advanced, or at least as advanced as the most advanced nation uh, in this world, there I have found a unique system. And that uh, system is that all the work of production is not done only in the factory. It is also done inside the home. And probably the Japanese women make a larger contribution than the Japanese men. So, <laughs> if there can be evolved a sort of system whereby the family life may not be damaged, and the woman also can earn, and actually productivity of the wealth of that nation, I don't think that Islam at all it stands in the way. But the canons of discipline and decorum and decency still have to be maintained at all costs. In fact, this afternoon, a lady phoned me up to say whether she can read the Quran and send the blessings of that recitation to her state. She may be in the audience, for all I know. She may be afraid to ask questions, but I, who remember the question, to you, I'm asking the Morana, that this question must be answered to her satisfaction, that whether she can read the Quran and send the blessings to her dear dead wife. I, I, I don't know really why this question at all arose in the Muslim community because it is a very well known fact that in the custom in the Muslim community all through the centuries, reading the Quran cannot be considered as something which can be prohibited in any country. There is one thing. And the other thing is reading of the Quran is a virtue according to Islam. And uh, the third point to be noted is that the principle, which is the principle of the extension of the mercy of God to the death, when a person dies, he has no more any opportunity for adding to the to the to to to, to the list of his virtues because he he goes away from this place. It is the extension of the mercy of God for the dead that he has allowed and this has been allowed in Islam. This is found clearly laid down in the Hadith that an act of virtue can be done by those who are alive or those who are dead. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give the benefit of that virtue to those for whom it is sent. And it, it, it has been clearly and historically and unambiguously recorded in the books of Hadith. Not, there was not one case of this type, there were several cases of this type. So the act of virtue which we wish to transfer to the, to any dead person that act of virtue may be reading the Quran or it may be helping some person with our charity and that charity also can be in so many forms whether we feed the hungry or we give some money from, from our pocket to anybody or we, if we are teachers, we just teach that another person is without charge we see or we are doctors, we, we just uh, give advice to a sick person without charge we see and it's all this virtue. And any virtuous act which we wish to be transferred to a dead person is always transferred and that dead, dead person gets the benefit out of it. Maybe that there are some new chemical sects 
which have there is a man who might have raised the question, but it, 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 it has been a unanimously accepted thinking in the world of science. He wants to know what is the Islamic attitude to superstition. For example, cutting your nails, cutting your superstition to that nature. I may say in connection with superstition, Superstition is any act of belief or any practical act which may have no rational foundation or which may have no foundation either in revealed guidance or in the accepted canons of human reason. That is called Something of which we cannot find the cause and its utility and its uh, rationale as it's called. Now, <clears throat> Islam has prohibited from believing in all systems because in Islam, Iman is based on a rational acceptance of things. Islam does not believe in blind faith. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls himself Al-Haq, the truth and the really real, as we might translate it. And this concept of Al-Haq is there in connection with the world in which we live, in connection with the guidance which came to us, that has been called Deemul Haq. And the Holy Quran clearly distinguishes between Al Haq and Al Bafil, or something which is firmly based either in revelation or in vision, and a thing which has no foundation, and which is just uh, uh, believed in on the basis of hearsay or on the basis of caprice or in the basis of vagaries, you see, that is, uh, Islam does not allow us to believe in anything of that sort. So, superstition may be of any kind. If any such thing ever comes before you, before any Muslim, if anybody teaches any such thing, then it is the duty of that Muslim to inquire from that person, to prove as to what is the basis for saying that? Has that thing been mentioned in the Quran or has that thing been mentioned in the Hadith? If it has no foundation in the Quran and in the Hadith, even then it is possible that it may have a foundation in healthy human reason. Then from that point of view, it will be open to the individual concerned to test it, either to accept it or not. But the testing according to the Quran should be on a rational basis and not on the basis of any blind faith. Then so and so was saying this and so and so was saying that. Or people believed in it for 1000 years and people believed in it for 5000 years. People might have believed in it. It may have been absolute nonsense. Muslims are born, are not born to be superstitious. The very attitude of superstition should not be there. Superstition I have already defined. There may be certain things. For instance, in science, we have got the in inductive method for arriving at certain conclusions. And the inductive method is this, that about any reaction of any of anything That reaction we don't know. Stable reaction of that thing. So we perform experiments again and again. And if we finally come to the conclusion that always takes place in the same fashion, then it is something which has not been mentioned in the Quran or in the Hadith, but then it becomes a part of knowledge. 
And on that basis, it no more remains superstition. I am uh, emphasizing this point particularly in, in connection with uh, certain things. You see. There are superstitions in all communities. Uh, some people believe that if you go out of your home and immediately a check runs from one side to the other and crosses your path, you see, then, then it is uh, a bad omen. You see? Alright? If anybody tells you, then tell him. I'll try. I'll see. I'll experiment in this. You see? I'll try that the cat passes in front of me as many number of times as possible when I go out of the home. Then I'll record the reactions or the consequences. And if I find that I have experimented it 100 times and I always miss this something is bad, alright, even though it may appear to be superstition, it is a, an established scientific fact, although I may not know what is the connection between the, the crossing of the cat and my going is pure. I may not be able to know, you see, but uh, this is the scientific method. And this scientific method Muslims have been asked, it has been made obligatory on them to employ. Because probably many of you don't know that the scientific method of, it, of inquiry or the inductive method is one of the greatest contribution of the Holy Prophet Muhammad to mankind. And the Holy Prophet has condemned superstition mongers and superstition like like him. <laughs> How do you answer this? Apart from the Quran, how do you answer this on the basis of reason? Sorry, you get my question? The answer to this, I may speak the same type of language. The answer to this does not lie in prostitution. If at all the compatibility is to be found out, in medical science, the scientists have evolved those methods whereby the harmonical efficiency of the human constitution can be measured. It is all, it all depends on the harmonical efficiency. It all depends on the health of the gland, on the glandular efficiency and uh, instead of going to the length of indulging in prostitution, the doctors are not yet dead, the person can go if he is so cynical and I, I, I'm, I'm using this word not for insulting anyone, remember this. Because to me it appears to be, I am also a medical man, I have also studied uh, medicine and I am a consulting physician. If a person becomes so cynical, let him do it, for that also a healthy way is open. May I say, I married my wife and my father married my mother. Without ever knowing, I didn't know about my wife, anything. Because my wife belonged to a family which observed further. And our life is a model for other pairs. And in my family, it's a very large family, the parda is observed. And in that, this family there has not been even 2% cases of divorce or of separation 
or a bad relations between the husband and the wife. Go to any western country and find out how happy did their married lives are. I will say not this companionate marriage, but it's something that's extremely obscene. That innocent type of course it used to be in the Victorian age. That was there. When couples marry on the basis of this courtship, how, how much stability is there in, in, in marriage? And how much stability is there in the marriages in those families, in families like mine? This is a matter of statistics in the field of sociology. From the point of view of psychology again, any marriage which is courted in romance is bound to fail. Any marriage entered into on the basis of romance is bound. And 99% of them do fail. Why? From the psychological point of view, they the male and the female who court one another in a spirit of romance actually live in a paradise of fools. They create images which are not there in life. Life is something bitter. Married life means an, an obligation and not a pastime, not a recreation. Romance places before both of them the image as if all life is a garden of roses and those, those roses will bloom further and further. They don't. They cannot. The moment they marry, the wife comes in the home, poor lady, she gets her first child and she starts getting sick. And when the husband comes back to the home from the office, tired, he finds his wife sitting there morose and sad and sick. He says, what? What nonsense? <laughs> you see, the entire grace and entire charm and entire false imagery of the romance vanishes into thin air the moment marriage takes place. Takes place. And consequently, all wise men advise never to indulge in romance. Islam advises when you have to choose your partner, the Holy Prophet Alayhi Salatu Islam says, of course, Muslims are permitted to see each other. The would be husband should see the would be wife. Whether they should both see one another, whether they are physically healthy and normal or not, you see, or whether the wife would like the features of the husband or the husband would like the features of the wife. So far, that is possible. Then the moral character of both of them can be found out easily, you see, without meeting one another. The Holy Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam has advised that when any Muslim woman or man wants to see the partner, the first, con the first consideration there should be his or her character, not her features or her wealth or his wealth or his high office and so on. So no, character, the integrity of character. And the Holy Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam mentions the charms, physical charms only at the end. That all things being equal, if, uh, if uh, one person has more physical charm, naturally the human being likes a person who is more charming, physical. But that is not something which is actually, which actually comes. The point of view that the Holy Prophet and the Holy Quran has given is very different from the modern Western point of view. And this, unfortunately, this modern Western point of view has <coughs> entered into our society also in certain segments of work. So it's a lot. 
the point of view of the modern western man woman has become pursuit of sensuous pleasure pursuit of sensuous pleasure and they take life as such even though they might pretend that they are soaring high flying in the world of romeo and juliet in the and they in the sublime paradise of romance no sublime paradise is romance all vulgar thoughts nothing else they run after one another i mean say this is something which is plain history and it is a fact now it is the very nature of sensuous physical pleasure that it dies out the moment it is obtained it does not remain It does not any type of physical sensuous pleasure. You go to see a very big drama, some very good drama. If you are a drama fan or you are if you are a cinema fan, you just go to see. You might feel pleased. You might enjoy seeing that, but then it requires. after you are finished with it you feel you are empty this is the psychological experience anybody can do it you don't feel you are full hear any type of music and after that music stops then you require to feel you are empty in the same manner this has look of youth this exuberance of what is called the sex attraction between opposite sex it comes as a blind force there is a biological as behind it and there is a psychological imagery which is there it is not something which it is not something which is based on any calculation that 1 plus 1 makes 2 no it is all again in the field of emotion an emotion is something blind it is not like this it is not the domain of this self is hard so the holy quran has made it very clear and here lies the salvation it says women ayati hi and among the signs of god an khalaqa lakum min anfusikum azwajan that he had made he has made the male and female from this same species of the same nature in the tasunu ilaiha so that when the male and the female enter into the bond of marriage they may get a spiritual consolation primarily the spiritual consolation the spiritual consolation which comes from companionship this spiritual companionship is the biggest force in life in all the ordeals of life i am held by the moral force of the personality of my wife and in all the ordeals of life she is supported by what she thinks in me to be my moral integrity our companionship is primarily spiritual and consequently never in our life there has taken place a single quarrel anything at any time in the worst moments of course in every married life all types of moments come and people say let all tears be like this dr ansarian's wife i did not enter into marriage with her for her physical charm 
I didn't know what she was. I came to know her because of that Parda system only after I was married to her. But as the Holy Prophet Ali said, of course I was trying to be a good Muslim then and also now. He said, he says to the husband, remember, and that is what he said as his last charter of rights and duty at the time of the farewell pilgrimage. He said, Remember, O oh husband, your wives are a divine trust in your life. Take care. And he said, the trust of a friend itself is sacred. And how sacred and holy and great must be that trust which is called the trust of God. So I felt for my wife in that manner. My wife felt about me in that manner, and this has been told. And the life has been extremely happy. And in this case, you see what happens. The husband and the wife grow old. All that madness of the youth, that physical madness of the youth goes away. It's all, all of it cools down. The beauty of married life is that as they grow in age, and especially in old age, they should be capable of loving one another more and more. This is possible only in the Islamic attitude of life and to, and to marriage. This is not possible there. So the very point of view is wrong. I may, I may tell you about the Islamic ideal of marriage. I think the youth of today must listen. They post to be very romantic, but they do not understand what romance means. 